of minutes while everybody's joining. I see we just uh, up to I just have a hundred already. Um, just some housekeeping rules um, while we're waiting for everybody to join. Um, this event will be streamed on YouTube uh, tonight as well, in case you have any uh, trouble with the Zoom platform. Um, some upcoming um, events from SADA. Tomorrow night, the Border K branch is hosting Dr. Avish Jagatpal, um, who, will having, who will be having a webinar on occlusion in implantology. And on Thursday night, the Northwest branch again is hosting Ms. Lee Scott and Ms. Franz Shadavit, who will be speaking on dental ergonomics. Um, for tonight, uh, for this event, you will be receiving one clinical CEU. Uh, your CPD certificates will be loaded on the, uh, the SADA platform and you'll be able to access all your certificates under your membership profile. Uh, if you are not a SADA member, you will be able to create a profile for yourself and access your CPD certificates there. Uh, for SADA members who have not logged onto the new SADA system, um, who have received the passes in the last uh, couple of weeks, please go and um, have a look at the new uh, membership profile section. You will see when you log onto your CPD events, you will actually be able to immediately um, print and create uh, a CPD log basically that you can submit to HPCSA should your CPD points be audited, which makes life a lot easier. So please go and check that out. Uh, for this evening, we will not be using the raise hand function on Zoom. Um, at the bottom, there is a Q&A section on your screen. Please make use of the Q&A um, Q section. We will go through the questions um, at the end, once the speaker has gone through his presentation, um, depending on the time allowed, uh, we may not get, be able to get all through, uh, through all the questions, but we will do our best to try and get through everything. Um, I'm just looking at the participants. We're just up to 100 at the moment. We'll just give a couple of minutes more for, for some, some late joiners to come in tonight. As I said, this um, webinar is also streamed live on YouTube tonight as well. For those of you who are not able to access the Zoom platform. Still, still going up. From um, SADA head office, we would just like to thank the Northwest branch, Dr. Gerrit Janssen Reesberg and his team for, for hosting SADA, to, for hosting this event for us tonight um, as well. He will be introducing the speaker in a couple of minutes. Right, we're up to 13. I'm going to give it another 30 odd seconds and then we should be ready to go. Right, just a reminder for those of you coming in late, please do not make use of the raise hand function this evening. Please make use of the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen and we will try and go through all the questions at the end of the lecture. Right, with that, um, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Gerrit Janssen van Rensburg, who will be introducing our speaker for this evening. Thank you, Dr. Janssen van Rensburg. Good evening, delegates. We would like to welcome Dr. Abram to this webinar tonight. He's a full-time private practice and part-time consultant at the University of the Western Cape. He completed his dental undergraduate degree at the University of the Western Cape cum laude in 2004. He completed his maxillofacial oral surgery degree in 2014, cum laude. He has a keen interest in implantology, temporomandibular joint disorders, and orthognathic surgery and facial trauma. Dr. Abram enjoys playing squash, running, and outside of work, work he enjoys spending time with his wife and his children. Over to you, Dr. Abram. Hello. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I like to thank Sada for giving me the opportunity to give this talk this evening. Hopefully I won't be too long. Um, I'm gonna keep it simple. Uh, I guess what we're trying to achieve is to understand the TMJ. It's, it takes a long time to, to, to get to a point where you really know what's going on. And uh, hopefully I can shed some light on uh, what, what I do, my personal experience. And uh, I've sort of stolen from all my mentors and, and put together what works for me. And uh, yeah, I'll just share my experience with you this evening. Let's go. Can I start? Yeah, you can start.
Okay, so we um, putting together a lecture like this is, is, is often very difficult, uh, largely because you've got to pitch it at the right level, you know. Uh, and what I thought I would do is look at what temperament of the disorders are, um, looking at the intraarticular issues, and then also looking at the extraarticular anatomy and how those things are affected. And just, uh, just touch on some of the bony issues, the muscular issues, uh, and some other pains in the head and neck area. I'm not going to divulge too much into, into atypical facial pain and neuropathic pains, because that's a totally different lecture on its own. Um, but just trying to, to get the, the TMJ, to understand the TMJ is, is already a difficult um, scenario. So let's try and do that. So getting to my point, if, if we're going to look at um, the, the, the disorders of the, of, the, of the head and neck, so all, all these neurologic disorders on the right hand side here are definitely not things that we'll be looking at. In today's time, especially if you work in a hospital that, that has a multitude of, of different specialities, often you find um, patients with conditions that, that overlap. And a lot of the patients that I see uh, have myofacial pain, largely have myositis, fibromyalgia, um, and it's the ability to fine-tune through all of these conditions. What I'm going to, if you look at joint disorders, um, we'll just touch on a few of these things and try not to make it too difficult. But the aim is to get to a point where we can all identify the most common temperament ability disorders, uh, and in that way, um, improve the ability to practice, especially because we do see a lot of these patients um, as well. So looking at the anatomy, um, I'm going to touch on some of the musculature, uh, looking at the capsule and some of the lig ligaments, and, and, and just look at the basic things that we need to understand when looking at the MJ. So I think, you know, if, if you, whenever you encounter a patient with temperament of joint disorders, you'll find that these groups of muscles are the ones, uh, especially with myofascial pain, that are most commonly affected. Um, if you look at the temporalis muscle, an understanding of the origin and insertion of this particular muscle is very important. And likewise, the masita uh, also very important. We all know that the masita arises from the zygomatic arch. And often you find that there are trigger points in this particular area. Patients with temporal with myofascial pain will often complain of, of temporal pain. And if you examine this particular muscle as big and fleshy as it is, you'll either find trigger points in this area or you'll find trigger points at the tenderness insertion at the coronary process. Uh, and often these patients have conditions or symptoms of, of, of a tendonitis in that, in that particular area. So if this is what my old professor used to say, it's must knowledge, you must know. Um, the medial pterygoid also, um, again, understanding the anatomy of this particular muscle will give you an idea of why patients complain of pain at the corners of the, of the, of the mandible or in the throat, they would often refer to. Um, and that's because of the uh, pterygomasoteric sling also possibly being in spasm. Looking at the lateral pterygoid, and, uh, you know, again, and how closely related it is to the, um, to the capsule and to the temperament of the disc. I'll try and simplify this as best as I can as we go along. Uh, to try and make things a bit more understandable. When you look at some of the management and the therapeutic things that I make use of, again, the anatomy of these muscles, it's very, very important. So the disc itself is paramount. Um, it's understanding what the disc looks like, where the disc is supposed to be, the different zones of the disc, and a lot of the well, TMJ surgeons or maxillofacial surgeons that do a lot of TMJ surgery um, have looked at disc position, where the disc needs to be. Um, and often patients will complain to you and tell you, I have a, a, a noise or a clicking joint, there's a click in my joint, or I have you know, sounds, you have gritty sounds in my joint. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to those things. 
understanding the capsule itself, understanding the ligaments, and we see how multifactorial it is um, to get to a diagnosis. Any one of these uh, particular uh, ligaments or tendons can be uh, can trigger certain conditions in the head and neck. So if you look at the anatomy of the disc, we know it's biconcave. We also know that there's a superior joint space and we know there's an inferior joint space. The disc or the biconcave nature should cup onto the head of the condyle. In most cases, it is like that, but often the ones that I see, the disc is not in this position. Um, and we look at ways of identifying exactly where the disc is. And also we'll look at what the diagnostic parameters are to identify whether the problem is outside of the joint, if it's in the muscles, or if the problem is inside the joint. Um, and the most important thing here is your clinical examination. So what do we do? We have to understand what the joint does, and we have to understand what the constituents of the joint is and what the functions of these joints are. So we know that the disc is, is, is connective tissue, um, and it's a shock absorber. It helps with fluid distribution, and it divides the joint into two compartments. We also know that above it, we have a glenoid fascia. And I always tell the patients, what the, the bony architecture has to look like is uh, a glistening soup bone. And we all know the cartilage layer of the soup bone. It has to be shiny, healthy tissue. And that's in a, uh, if we're in a state of homeostasis, that particular joint will look like that. Um, and again, looking at the condyle, what does the condyle look like, how big it is, um, and what are the diagnostic uh, tools that we use to identify if there are problems in the condyle itself. So this is one of my favorite slides when I consult patients, just to give them an idea of what we see and what we are looking for. We're looking for this particular relationship. We're looking for a nice layer, layer of fiber cartilage on the, on, the, on the head of the condyle, likewise on the glenoid fossa. And we wanna make sure that all those things are rosy um, before we treat these patients. Now, the, the most important take home message I wanna get here is that I do not treat uh, a TMJ patient or TMD patient unless I've got a diagnosis. And if you don't have the right diagnosis, obviously the patient will not get better when you treat them. So there are variations in condyle, and this is the anatomy of the condyle obviously differs um, amongst the population. And very importantly, why I show this slide is that we cannot rely on a panoramic X-ray um, and point to the condyle and say that the condyle looks irregular in shape um, it's most likely that the condom is the problem. Um, and just to give you an idea is that there are lots of different variations uh, in, the, in the osteology. And that also plays a major role when we diagnose these patients. So if you look at the uh, synovial membrane, you all know it's a very busy slide, but the most important thing is the functions of the synovial fluid. When we have patients with internal TMJ problems, um, in all the uh, international training that I've done and, and, and spent some time with experts in TMJ, the most important thing for TMJ is to that the, the joint is lubricated. Um, and we'll, we'll chat about how we do those things a bit later on. That's the most important thing. Okay, we won't look at the actual spaces, but just to give you an idea, it's a very, very, very small joint. And um, we must understand that when you have joint narrowing because of a pathological process, that it's even more difficult to work on this joint with minimally invasive techniques that I'll allude to a bit later. What are the pressures? Um, obviously, when you're closing, the pressures are a lot higher, but we'll, we'll, we'll chat about that. This is a very important slide. And what it shows is when you have normality, the joints are happy, the muscles are happy. Um, we, have, we have a state of homeostasis, everything is in, in good, good nick. The moment we start introducing other things like macro trauma, fall on the chin, or a bump, or a child knocked into you at school, parafunction, bruxism, or clenching, um, overloading the joint, increasing joint friction. These are the things that start 
to overwhelm the TMJ. And when you overwhelm the TMJ, you start producing um, metabolites that are not good for the TMJ at all. So there are degrad de degradation happening inside the joint. Um, and what you find is that you start changing the, the, the um, homeostasis of the joint and you also start changing the anatomy of the joint. This is why even if a patient only has just a muscular issue, or even if they have a combination of muscular as well as intraarticular problems, it's very, very important to offload the joint, to take the pressure off the joint. Because um, that allows the body to find, to go from this situation back to that situation where we can get some form of remodeling. Um, so it's very important that we understand that the loading of the joint has to be changed, um, especially when, with the most common ones being bruxing and clenching um, and obviously occlusal interferences. A simple thing like um, a crown that's ill-fitting or a filling that's too high um, over, a, over a period of time, that does have an effect on the TMJ. Again, some anatomy. So what is the trigger point? We often, we all dentists and we go to the, our cardio practice and our physios regularly um, because we have trigger points in the shoulder blades or in the lower back. And we all know from, from anatomy and from um, life sciences that the, the actin and myosin filaments are, they like to run parallel to one another. So if you have a trigger point, it's painful. And these are skeletal muscles that we work with, whether it's the muscles of mastication or if it's the muscles in the lower back, they're still muscles, skeletal muscles, and they behave exactly the same way. The um, neuromuscular end plate, understanding what happens here with the release of acid bioquiline and the stimulus of the, of the skeletal muscle is important when we look at therapeutic measures um, managing these particular uh, myofascial pain conditions. Now, just a, a variety of different types of trigger points that you'll find um, in practice. The most common being these ones, as well as these ones, as well as these ones. So, but don't throw away when we have different types of crepitus uh, or, or um, of trigger points in the head and neck. I um, often find patients coming from the neurologist with uh, because of postural conditions where they ask me to make a, a, um, a bite plate just to assist these patients with their clenching. So these are common trigger point areas. And when I examine a patient with head and neck uh, pain or with myofascial pain, I examine all these, these areas because these are the common ones. And it's very important to have a look at these. And, and usually it's just, you can feel it with the tips of your finger. You can feel those knots jump when you examine these patients. And often they will tell you, you know, it's the pain is worse in the morning when I wake up. You know, they were clenching whilst they were sleeping or they tell you, you know, it's, it's worse in the evening. And you can sort of work out exactly where the issues are. So this is a particular patient that I saw uh, some time ago. But just the importance of the clinical examination is that you can see this lady does, does clean, she does grind. And I'll show you um, what she looked like before treatment a bit later. So the anchor disc phenomenon described by Dorit Nitsen, who is probably one of, the, one of the leading experts in TMJ surgery in the world. I, I was fortunate to meet her um, in, in Austria a few years ago. And you know, coming back to the lubrication, she was telling in all her experience Throughout the years, she's found that lubricating a joint is the most important thing. And I found that in practice as well. As soon as you start lubricating the joint, the patients get better. Um, so what are the diagnostic parameters? I've sort of looked at different ways that work for me, starting off with the clinical examination and then moving on to the more uh, you know, invasive uh, examinations to see um, what, what helps us. In the old days, they use, off, off, you know, they use contrast arthrograms. Um, they use transcranial views. Fortunately for us in, in, in this day and age, we, we, we have a lot more uh, diagnostic, a lot of things that are a lot more diagnostic for us. 
Um, and coming to my point is that we, we cannot use a Panodex to diagnose a TMJ issue. Um, this particular case, the TMJ problem or the pain is most likely coming from the wisdom teeth in, in this particular area. In the old days, and this is, you know, looking at the position of the condyle in the fossa, looking at the shape of the condyle, again, it has no diagnostic value unless it's gross, gross changes in the, in the, in the head of the condyle. Um, we are fortunate enough to no longer make use of these old images. And uh, so fortunately for us, it's a lot easier to make a diagnosis. Um, instead of using these old transcranial views, we can make use of CT scans. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, the Panerix does have a role. It does play a role. But in a condition like this, which one causes the pain? Is it the cloudiness happening in the joint itself? Or is it the lone standing wisdom tooth with a large cavity on it? And this brings us to the point that we still have to examine the dentition as far as possible. I've had patients in the ward referred to me by physicians and neurologists um, who've been in the hospital for a few days, MRIs and a whole host of CT scans done and all the patient needed was a root canal. So, you know, it's very, very important um, to look at the patient's teeth. I mean, th that's what we do and, and, and examine the rest of it uh, as far as possible. When looking a bit closer, you can see there are gross disturbances on the spine. So we know from this panoramic view that we need to do another special investigation. Um, when you look at a CT scan, if you compare the, the opposite side, you'll notice that there are definitely destructive processes happening uh, in the condyle in the other side. You can see that the cortex is missing. You can see that the metal spaces are, are eroded. And you can see that the joint space is narrow. All of, well, not all of us, but most of us have access to CT scans or, or, or even cone beam CT scans. And we are able to see this type of pathology on, on these particular scans. So this brings in another dynamic is that, you know, is it one, is it osteoarthrosis or osteoarthritis, which we know comes from um, traumatic problems, high filling, crown, um, trauma, grinding, clenching. Is it rheumatoid? Because that means a whole lot of other serological tests that go with it. Or is it something um, called idiopathic condyle resorption? So we have to look at did the patient have orthodontics recently? Um, you know, things, is it an infection? There's a lot of things that it can be. But based on the, the image that we're looking at, the CT scan that we're looking at, um, is just an adjunct to the clinical examination and the medical background that we've taken from the patient. Again, CT scan gives us a lot, but if a patient presents in your office and when you examine them, you find that there's either a deviation on opening, one, or the patient cannot open their mouth wide enough, or the patient has um, a history of, or says to you, I, I, my, my son knocked his head in my chin and it's been locked since then. The scan is an adjunctive uh, investigation that allows us to make a proper diagnosis. We know from a scan like this with an ankylosed TMJ, we know that this is obviously post-trauma or post-infection from a few years ago. Uh, if you find that somebody, um, this is the, the panelix that I showed you earlier, a condition called synovial chondromatosis, um, but again, they all flow into one another to make a diagnosis of, of where we are. The CT scan again can show us um, the initial st start or the starting phase of, of osteoarthritis. But the most diagnostic um, modality is, is an MRI. I'm very fortunate that uh, I have access to dynamic MRI, so we can actually ask the patient to open and close their mouths, and we can actually see what the disc is doing in real time using MRI. And if you look at this side here, you can see on a T2-weighted MRI that is, um, just to give you an idea, so looking at the MRI, often um, my referral guys will say, you know, I, I can't really, I don't really understand the MRI, but looking at this, the cortex is black, it's not white, and the marrow spaces light up because of the fluid. If you go to this side, you can see that the marrow space is lit up and you can see the outline of the cortex 
And as we go forward to the disc, you can see that there's lighting up there. Um, and that's usually indicative of, of inflammation inside the joint. And that patient will either have, um, he will point to the, to the preauricular area and tell you that this is, it's, a, it's painful, I can't bite. It's really sore when I open my mouth. Um, and often you'll find that they can't really open too wide because of the increased uptake there, there's a lot of inflammation inside that joint. Again, looking at a, a non-reducing disc, you can see how the disc is clenched or, or clumped up in front of the in front of the condyle, and these patients are, uh, cannot open their mouths because of the, um, the the anatomical interference. It just prevents you from articulating correctly. So this is one of the patients um, I actually draw on the scan for them to show them that the one side is normal. You can actually see that it's the, the disc is in the correct position and the opposite side, um, the disc is in the incorrect position. Um, so when I consult them, I'll always draw, the, you know, draw where the disc is and what, what the disc is doing. And only when I find that the disc is in the wrong place and that the disc is painful or the patient has pain, will we do something a bit more invasive um, than the usual stuff. So sometimes on CBCT, you can, depending on the scanner, you can see um, a bit of an uh, adherence. So you can see the anchor disc phenomenon or disc that's stuck, um, but it's a bit, it's, it's a lot better on, a, on, on an MRI. It's a lot easier to see. Again, looking at perforations or, you know, looking at uh, this position being medially rotated, um, it's, it's all part of the diagnostic assessment when we treat these patients. And once we've gone through all of that, we then classify according to the world's classification. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit of a laborious process to go through every one of them. Um, but in my treatment, I usually classify them according to this. There's, a, there's, a, there's another classification that's a bit more detailed. And I thought I'll just keep it a bit, um, keep it uh, simple. You go from painless clicking where there's no locking to a patient that has severe locking and joint crepitus. Um, so that's either your disc is completely perforated or it's torn. Um, and I'll show you examples a bit later. So when I see somebody, this is um, a pain evaluation. Um, it allows us to quantify clinical um, complaints. So we are able to put a number to it. And when we see them in six months time or in a year's time, we can see if they're getting better or not. Um, it's, I think it's very important to do this type of thing if you're seeing TMJ patients, um, because it gives you, that you know if you're doing something right or wrong. The dysfunction index, this is how we were trained. Um, we were trained to assess these patients like these and we could group them into different um, uh, descriptions and, and, and scores. Uh, and it allows us to make a, you know, a, an informed decision as to what we need to do for these particular patients. I must say the ones that come to, to me, or I'm sure to many of my, my, my MaxFact colleagues, um, are the ones who are in two or three. Um, a lot of the dental colleagues can manage, the, uh, you know, the first two groups, um, but the ones that come to us are usually in two and three, and we aim to get them down. And I always tell the patients, that the main aim of my treatment is to improve your quality of life, but also to improve, improve um, to reduce your pain and to allow you better movement. That's that's the main, um, uh, we, I never try and give them false hope and say that we'll get rid of everything. Uh, we try and improve it for them and we do that over a period of time. Again, this is not a Usain Bolt moment, I tell them. I think this is a, this is a marathon. So we, we, we're not gonna expect a change overnight. You know, we, we, we expect this to get better with time and if you win them over like that, they, you know, they become genetic, they become compliant. Because a lot of them have, because they're so frustrated with all of this, you know, the pain has been there for so many months, they're not getting better. They've seen two, maybe two people before you, um, and they, they realize that, you know, they, be, they get depressed and they're not in a good space when you see them. So, yeah, uh, often it's a bit tricky to manage them, but we, we do get there. So what do I do when we manage them? We look at the most uh, the simplest things. We start off with getting the correct diagnosis. And whether it's a muscular disorder or whether it's an intraarticular disorder, it starts off with non-pharmacotherapy. You know, so we, we always try and educate them, get them to do 
uh, we, we involve the physiotherapists. I like to you know, get some dry needling if we need to, and the use of, of good occlusal appliances. We try and soften their diet. And again, we reaffirm the chronic nature of this disease so that they, um, they understand that it's gonna take a bit of time to get better. So very importantly, you know, these patients are often, often frustrated and they're depressed because they're not getting better. And a lot of them are well informed because they looked at Google and they looked at different things um, and they want their disc to be in the right place. Um, but that's not always possible, you know? So what do we do? You can use a whole host of things. And these are the things that I make use of. Um, things like topical creams, that's a bit old school. I'd rather use like a trans act patch, um, homeopathics, pain modulators, the, you know, using non-steroidals, muscle relaxants, Botox, corticosteroids, a whole host of things, and we'll go through examples of all of these. So this is probably the stuff that we use the most. Um, I'm not to say I'm a, I'm a, I'm a homeopathic uh, person, but I must say uh, in the short term, the use of, I used to use um, celestone, if I have an intraarticular problem, um, using one mole of celestone into the joint, we did a lot before. I must say, I haven't done that in a very long time. Um, largely because of the, the risk of, uh, you know, osteoporosis of the head of the, of the condyle. Um, but I do use anti-inflammatories quite a bit. And depending on the severity, um, I always try and start with the most with the least uh, aggressive uh, anti-inflammatory. So you can try Zephyr, which is quite safe, or, or Celebrex. And if it's a really, really bad pain, I go to Alcoxia. Depending on the weight, we'll, we'll adjust the dosage. But what I do like, and this might sound strange, is that I, I often use uh, Onica drops. And I use Rescue Remedy drops. Because these patients are, are sleep deprived, number one. They don't sleep. Um, a lot of them are really stressed. And I can see in, during the COVID time now, during the lockdown, you know, people phone me and I'd see a lot more TMJ, myofascial pain patients because of the, the stress that they're under. Um, and introducing something like, like you know, the Onica drops and the, and the rescue remedy drops plays a significant role in, giving, in getting them some sleep uh, and also uh, relieving them a bit from some stress. And as a last line, you know, you can make use of tricyclic uh, antidepressants just to lift the mood a bit. And these patients actually do well on some amitriptyline. Botox. Um, you know, I, I, I use quite a bit of Botox in, in, in my myofascial pain patients. And uh, it works phenomenally well. Um, and I often find that, um, but I, it's, it's like a total joint replacement. I sort of hold back on it to use it in my refractory patients that don't respond to the normal stuff. Um, and it gets to a point where you have to put some Botox in there just to get the muscles to relax a bit. Uh, it, does, it does help quite a bit. So this is a, bit, a lady that I, that I saw when I saw over about a, a two year period where she came in and she wasn't a particular happy, happy customer because you'll notice that she, she has uh, an element of, of masseteric hypertrophy on both sides. And, um, you know, very stressed out, highly stressful individual, um, highly stressful job, uh, clincher, you know, and I, I started her off with the basic stuff, but you'll notice just looking at her that you can see that the masita is, is a bit asymmetric in comparison to the opposite side. And she was quite tender to, to, to examination on that side. We injected her with, with Botox, um, and I usually put about 40 units in, in the masseters bilaterally. So it's 40 and 40, and I put about 10 units in the temporalis muscle. Um, and already you can see the change in her uh, facial um, uh, proportions. And this is, a, so this is about, I think 12 months after, after Botox. And this is two years after the second dose of Botox. And already you can see the, the masseter starting to, to look a lot better. Um, and if you compare, you'll notice that 
just by introducing bite splint therapy. And she had two rounds of Botox over a period of two years. Um, she actually said to me, I don't think I need to see you anymore because my pain's gone. And uh, all she needs to do is wear a bite splint now. So um, as, a, as, a, as a backup, I usually say to them, look, in the colder months when winter starts, start taking the Arnica drops and the rescue remedy if you're struggling at work. Um, because the aim of treatment is for you not to see me again. It's for me to treat you and get you better, and then your, your GP or your dentist can take over management. And for me, that, that works very well. Um, hyaluronic acid. So we spoke about the, the lubrication. And often, you know, if I do, if I do find that patient, patients have intraarticular issues, coupled with the Botox and the bite splint therapy, I would inject some of this Q20 into the into the TMJ. And this is a phenomenal lubricant um, that works very well. The orthopods use it in the knees and the shoulders and um, highly viscous material. Um, and I, I inject it under local. In, in, in fact, I don't even use local. I, I'll put it into the TMJ while, while it's in the chair. And what I found in patients where two, three years down the line where I do an open procedure on them is that you'll find that the sin visc is still in the joint. So it's a highly stable material and it does lubricate it very nicely. Uh, I find that, you know, the, it's best for me, well, pers it's a personal thing, but I find it's best that you inject it under local because they can tell you immediately that the joint is stiffening up. Um, and they can tell you that the sound's gone. Or the crepitus that they heard or the bony sounds they heard is, is, is less, has lessened. So that's diagnostic in a way as well. So it does play, it does, it does work very well. And it's my, instead of using the celestone, I've shifted to using hyaluronic acid gel um, almost completely. Um, so bite splint therapy, you can take your pick, the Mayo Health. I tend to use that in patients that are very sore. So we um, we use that in the acute phase. It, it does, does work very well. Um, but caution, obviously, the patient has to only sleep with this one because of posterior eruption. A full split, a full thickness. Um, now coming, you know, a, a full coverage Michigan bite split is still the mainstay. The patients often ask me, why do we need a bite split? What's so important? What does the bite split do? And a simple analogy is if you, uh, my son always say, Daddy, can you make a muscle? And you lift up the bicep and you, you'll find, you tell the patient, okay, lift, contract the bicep and what, what are you doing? So you actually, contracting, you know, you, you are uh, stiffening the bicep up. And by doing that, um, if you put your, fing your fingers on the sides of your cheek and you, and you clench, you'll find that the masita pops. Okay? So if you lift a dumbbell, you're contracting the muscle and the bicep pops. If you close your jaw together and you clench hard, your masita pops. So just imagine if you slept all night holding a dumbbell, contracting the bicep, how your arm would feel the next morning. What the bite plate does, it takes the, bite, the dumbbell down that much. So you're not contracting the muscle as much as you would. If you were clenching, you would be doing this all the time. But if you wear a bite plate, you're doing that. And like I said earlier at the beginning of the talk is that it's, it's skeletal muscle. If you stop stimulating it, you, um, you allow the muscle to relax. And one of the previous slides I showed you was the neuromuscular end plate. Now, what Botox does is it inhibits the release of acetylcholine. So it inhibits the ability of the muscle to contract. So if you use, what I found is that if I use Botox with um, splint therapy, it reduces the clenching potential of that particular patient and we find that the muscle contraction reduces, and we find that the symptoms of the knot formation in those muscles are also markedly reduced. Um, and that's the, the logic behind it. Yeah. And it works very well. It works very, very well. Um, you just need to know the landmarks, which is it's fairly simple, um, where to inject. So what I do is, is when I inject patients for Botox is I find the knot, and if it's in the safe zone of injecting, I'll in a way, do a bit of dry needling and go into that knot and deposit the Botox there. That works very well. They'll tell you the muscle, you know, they immediately will tell you that the, the, they could feel it jump and it's gone. So, um, yeah, it does, it, well, in my hands, it works, it works, it works very well. 
and I must say it does, it does have a major effect on, on, on the patients. If we no longer outside of the joint and we find that the problems we know from our MRI, that there's an increased uptake in the joint, there's uh, you know, the white band that's formed, we know that the disc is in the wrong position. The reason why the disc is in the wrong position is because it's now become overwhelmed. Um, the metabolites are freely available inside the joint space, inside the synovial fluid, and it's now starting to form almost cobweb-like material inside the joint. And these are referred to as adhesions. Now, when Nitsen spoke about the anchored disc phenomenon, the sucking effect of the disc into the renal fossa is largely because of adhesions. And we know that from arthroscopic, uh, arthroscopic work. Um, arthrocentesis still plays a major role. I mean, I still do it regularly. We, we, we go in and when I do an arthrocentesis, um, we'll wash the joint out and I'll deposit um, the hyaluronic acid uh, into the joint on completion. So we've washed the metabolites out, so all the bad things are gone and we've put a new layer of lubrication inside the joint. Um, and, and that's where we start, no more than that. Um, and it's a simple, uh, you know, we, okay, yes, in a, in a, in a damaged joint, uh, the narrowing of the joint is uh, significant. So finding the joint space can be tricky sometimes, but once you're in, you can flush that joint very nicely. Arthroscopy, um, please, it's, it's, it's not as simple as it looks. Uh, it's a steep learning curve. It, it's taken a while to, to sort of, um, not, I haven't even, you know, we can't say mastered it, but getting to a point where uh, diagnostic arthroscopy plays a major role in my practice. I mean, I use it regularly. And I always find it's, 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 it's quite a nice thing to have um, another max fact with you. I'm very fortunate by one of, one of my mentors in Dr. Stolowski with me. Um, but, uh, you know, when you do it together, you, you get an understanding of what's, what's going on in the joint. So going from identifying the extra articular muscles, checking that the muscles are okay, if there's any knots and spasm and all those things, to the MRI, we know there's an intraarticular problem. Is it, we've classified it according to Wilkes. And now we, following arthrocentesis, we've become a bit more invasive and we start doing intraarticular um, intra work. So we're doing diagnostic arthroscopies and we use um, specialized TMJ scopes to go into the joint um, to identify the following. So this is, um, just to, to orientate you, so this is the bottom, that's the condyle and the, and, and the disc. And here you can see the adhesion. And at the back there, you can see a little blood vessel, which shouldn't really be there. So that's the increased uptake that we see on the, on the, on the MRI. And we can see all these little cobwebs that shouldn't really be here. And this is when a joint's not happy. So it, it makes sense because we, this patient wouldn't be in theater for an arthroscopy if you had a normal joint. Um, so I'll just take you on a little video tour just to see um, what we see when we do an arthroscopy. Um, and there you can see an adhesion. And but, you know, often the disc in this situation would be uh, anterior displaced. Um, here you can see a little blood vessel again hanging up here. So there's all this angiogenesis taking place and that creates more inflammation. Um, you can see that the streaks of blood vessels on the green fossa and in, in, the, in the background there. Um, but at least we have a joint space. So from a diagnostic point of view, um, the prognosis for this joint is good as long as we wash it out nicely and we lubricate it again. But even more importantly, this person has to wear back. So we take, we allow the body to go back to normal. Um, again, a little bit easier over there. Uh, you know, often I refer to this as cobwebs, but the correct term is, is condromalacia. And here you can see the, the blood vessels, um, the increase in vasculature, and that often results in a painful joint. Another example, a, a bit more um, severe, you can see a lot of cobwebs in there, and um, quite a gritty joint. And this one actually shows, I hope you can see it, uh, just at the bottom here, we're getting to it now. You can see a lot of condromalation. This is quite a sticky joint. So these, these patients often can't open or they swing to the affected side um, with, with, with problems in, in that area. And just at the bottom there, you can start seeing there's a little perforation in the joint in the um, articular disc. So these 
again, depending on the surgeon, um, some people would prefer putting the disc back to where it should be. Um, I prefer making more room for the disc to move. Uh, it's just, it's like Gordon Ramsay and, and, and uh, what's the other ones, and, and these uh, ships. Uh, they all get there differently, they all have their own recipes, but the food still tastes good, you know? So um, we all do things a bit differently. Um, my, my take on it is make a room, make a room for, the, for, the, for the disc and try to preserve the disc as far as possible. And that works. So this is the lady I showed you earlier. This was a bite which you came to see me. Um, she had a closed lock, which is couldn't, couldn't open on, on, on the left side. And after an arthroscopy, that was a bite. So, you know, when you, it's the old analogy, you know, even a one millimeter sesame seed, if you bite on that, your bite's disturbed. If your disc is in the wrong place, your bite's disturbed, your occlusion will be thrown off. Um, and again, you know, from the clinical examination, you'll be able to identify that there's a problem inside the joint rather than in the muscle. Um, so going ahead, if we not successful with the arthroscopy or even whilst doing the arthroscopy, often when I do the arthroscopy, I consent the patient for an open procedure if I have to, um, based on the diagnostic uh, on the MRI, and we will go for an open arthroscopy. So if we look at this particular lady, we can see she has a torn disc. You know, it's very small, but if you look closely, you'll notice I just marked it with a little arrow there, that there's a, there's a perforation in her disc. Um, and she had joint pain and crepitus. They will tell you that there's um, a sound and it's sore. And often you'll find that there's a bit of swelling as well. So what we did with her, if you open up, you'll notice that she has quite a steep um, articular eminence. And just by flattening that eminence, doing an arthroplasty, um, you find that her main complaint was that my, my jaw gets stuck when I open. And if you take the eminence away, the jaw is no longer stuck. So you've treated her main complaint, you know. Um, but not every patient is an open procedure. I'm very selective of, you know, who gets what. Um, but just to show you how steep this eminence is, and just by flattening it out, um, the patient was better. In fact, she came to me to do the opposite side. I said she just had to put the brakes on a bit because, you know, maybe I got lucky with the first one. So um, moving on to another patient, if you look closely, this eminence, you can't, you can't almost see it. It's completely flat, but you can see a little fold on the disc. Um, but once you release the capsule from the zygomatic arch, you can find that if you smoothen it out and how loose and free the disc is now. And that allows them good movement, okay? And if you look at a disc that's a bit more steep, this particular area had the same, same problem, a closed lock and the sound that she didn't like, um, that was painful, click in the joint. But if you take the disc down, um, you'll notice that the disc is free. It can do what it wants, you know, it can go back and forward, it can be stuck in front, but it won't get stuck because the joint will still be able to move. Um, so just to show you, if you look, sorry for my photography, but there's the head of the condyle underneath the, 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 the disc, but she's able to move quite freely. Um, this is testing uh, intraoperatively. And immediately postoperatively, she was fine. Um, please, this is not molecular surgery. It's, you know, sometimes we, we get fantastic results. Sometimes we, get, we don't get the same result we were hoping for. We do a perfect procedure and the result isn't what the patient wanted. So, so we've just got to be careful. And that's why I always reiterate with the patient. We try to improve the movement and we try and reduce the pain. Um, obviously, if you take the disc out, you've got to replace it with something. Um, we try not to do, you know, I, I, I try not to do many, many of these. But if you have a patient like this um, with, with, with TMJ, Issues. I mean, he had an underdeveloped TMJ, and clearly we can see that he, he had an underdeveloped jaw. Then we move on to the more aggressive forms of TMJ management. And in this case, it's he, he needed the combination of, of, of things. But just to point out that we do a, um, uh, a total joint replacement, and this is an alloplastic joint in combination with orthognathic surgery. So this is not a, a, a normal case, but just to show you what we can do. Um, a lot of the stuff I do with virtual planning, 
um, and we identify, you know, using uh, computer software um, where the problems are, what we need to dissect, and you know, all those things. And we can get some really good results. I mean, it's it's patient specific. But funny enough, even though we had a TMJ problem, his main issue was obstructive sleep apnea. So his autopharyngeal airway was that when he came to me. And after the surgery, it was that. So even though cosmetically he looks better and functionally he, he, he's better, um, at one, you know, this, this, he can breathe when he sleeps and doesn't obstruct, you know, so that's important. Um, so on the extreme side, from the clinical examination, you'd think that this guy um, had an aesthetic issue. The aesthetics was, was not his main problem. The problem was that he couldn't breathe when he sleeps. So even though we replaced his TMJs and did, did a few other things, um, we still address the main problem. Um, and that's, that's just him. And that's, that's him, I think, uh, six weeks post-op. And that's him six months post-op. So he's a happy chap. Um, yeah. This particular guy, not happy. So he had, you can see a bit of swelling on the left side there. He had trauma years back and developed bilateral TMJ ankylosis over time. Um, also, his bridges were failing and a whole host of things. But in, in a situation like this, you know, he, he needed bilateral TMJ replacements to, to assist him. So again, we design it and we do it. You can see the, the ankylosis there. Um, and on this side, you can see it there. Um, I think his intercessal opening was less than a centimeter. And um, we plan everything again using a lot of stereolith models. And I still take impressions, you know, works very important. We replace the joints. And um, just to show you how accurate these things are, even the little bone that we take out matches what we originally planned that we were going to remove. Um, and we, this seemed, I think, in three days post op, which was about to be discharged. That's the mouth opening we have. That's him at three months. That's him at six months. And that's him after a year. So, uh, you know, looking looking at the TMJ, um, still stable. But those are this is worst case scenario, and we we sort of that's my nuclear weapon. Try not to use it too soon, you know. Um, otherwise, you see, your, yeah. Okay, so that's it. I hope I've covered um, everything. I think I've stuck to my forty-five. Have I? Yeah, forty-six, forty-five minutes, and. Uh, I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Faker. Um, I'm going to go on to the, the Q&A section. We've got a few questions coming through. I'm just going to uh, start off with one that came through on the um, on YouTube. I'm reading it as is. It says, do you use um, bendiazepine at, an, at any point during your therapy? I did before, but, uh, you know, there's a, People become addicted quite quickly with those things, with benzos, you know? So I, I try to use other muscle relaxants and that's why I've shifted to using the, the Onica and the, the Rescue Remedy because there's, there's no dependence on that. Uh, and it's fairly safe for long-term usage. Um, when we look at muscle relaxants, when, when I see a need for that, I, I introduce uh, the amitriptyline as well. But uh, heat therapy is far better than, than using benzos um, largely because of dependence. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not a good thing to do. Thank you. Um, Piasclidine injection, is there any place for that? Um, the uh, person that asked the question says it works very well for my wife's hip. Say, say again? Uh, Piasclidine injection. Yeah, it, it does have a role. I mean, you can, you can use uh, you know, I'm not a. I'm not saying what I use. As I said, with, with Jamie Oliver and Gordon Ramsay, you can you can make up a recipe and get the same results. Um, what I what I what I find is that um, the neurologist opposite my, he also uses the same thing. He says, please make them a Maya health splint because my wife wears it, and I'll recommend it to anybody's wives. So 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 um, yeah. So it, you know, some people say to me, I don't like a Maya health. I prefer Michigan bicycle. If the screen works, it works. Um, uh, some people, again, like some people will do disclication 
but I don't, you know, uh, depends on the individual. Okay. Um, do you use the Piper classification at all? Not really. I stick to, I stick to, um, to the works. Um, keep it simple. Um, with a lot of different, with a lot of different experts out there. You've just got to find what works for you as a clinician. Um, again, look as an example. If, if you look at someone who manages the occlusion, you can, some dentists are excellent at managing occlusion. But I always say, if you have a patient that has um, occlusal interferences, what we should aim as clinicians is to examine the occlusion, see how we can improve that. Um, because, you know, when we did prosthetics, you always try and achieve a balanced occlusion on the full denture. All the contacts must touch. But on a patient that's dentate, it's very difficult to do that. And an orthodontist and a prosthodontist are, are excellent at finding those things for you. So finding a classification, whatever works for you. Thank you. What is the treatment for children with a mixed dentition that are grinding their teeth at night? Very difficult, eh? Uh, it's very expensive to think of it because you've got to make these vitamins uh, all the time. I always say to the patients, you know, like orthodontics, wait till the permanent dentition is completely erupted uh, and then start addressing that. If you start too soon, you, you're not going to achieve. And there's a lot of kids who grind their teeth and make no mistake. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it's like, it's like most things in dentistry. You don't place an implant on somebody who's 14 years old. Um, you wait until they're a bit older. Um, where do you inject Botox for the lateral pterygoids? Well, that's a tricky one. You can only do that through arthroscopy. Um, and, and doing that, I must say, you know, once you've mastered the arthroscope, which takes a couple of years, then only will you be able to start doing that. I don't, I don't inject uh, um, Botox into the lateral pterygoid, but internationally they do. Um, so... I must say I haven't had the need to do it. Um, what I'm doing sort of works for me, but whatever everybody else does, they can they can do as long as it works. If it's evidence-based and scientifically sound, I have no issue. Okay. But uh, no, no, you can proceed. No, no, I'm saying it's it's it, it needs a lot of skill to do that. Okay, thank you. We've got a few questions on on different bite plates, etc. Um, do you recommend hard or soft occlusal bite guard material for TMJ patients? You know, it depends. <laughs> um, I don't. I don't like. Uh, I don't like uh, you know, the softer ones. Sort of encourages the grinding, the clenching. Uh, the old school hard hard bite plates are still best. And again, when you make it on the top jaw or the bottom jaw, there are different clinical scenarios for different things. But I, I just thought, you know, for, for this particular audience, probably just to keep it as simple as possible. Um, and if you have a good technician, good experienced technician, you can discuss these options with them. Okay. Um, adding on to that, what are your views on a maxillary flexi bite splint instead of a maxillary Michigan bite splint, as many patients find the latter uncomfortable to sleep with? Well, there's a lot of technicians that are are sort of pushing for the flexi one. Um, the Michigan, it's, it's extremely difficult. And that's why what I do is for the first six months, sometimes to six months to a year, I give them a, a mild health because it, the tolerance with that is, is, a, lot, is a lot better. Uh, it only covers from K9 to K9. And once they've tolerated that, I then switch them slowly to a Michigan uh, the following year. And that, thing, that seems to be working quite, quite nicely. Um, the flexi is... Like a flexi denture, it's always more comfortable than, than um, a full acrylic denture, as an example. So the flexi bite splint does work well. Um, but as I said, you know what? You can do what you like. You can do it as long as you're offloading the joint, it's fine. Um, Dr. Faker, before we continue, I'm just going to ask this a question right at the bottom. Can you please maybe stop your screen sharing? Uh, the viewers would like to see you as you answer the questions first. Thank you so much. Um, do you recommend replacing missing teeth in the occlusion with partial dentures to assist in TMJ relief uh, for patients missing teeth and TMJ symptoms? Do you recommend a bite pad as well in, in adjunct to the dentures? Look, the occlusion is very important. You know, going back to, 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 to critical skin, um, 
most of the patients that we saw were, uh, you know, were, were, were either partially dentate or, or completely dentures. And they've lost vertical dimension almost completely. Um, if your occlusion is not stable, it's, you might as well build a house without the foundation. So if your dentition is in the correct position, we must remember that everything, you know, God gave us teeth to chew with. So the teeth, the roots of the teeth have periodontal ligaments and they have buttresses. So we know that the forces go through the PDL, through the cortex, through the marrow spaces, into the inferior border of the mandible and runs all the way up into the TMJ. If you disturb that biomechanics and TMJ takes strength. So if you don't have a stable foundation, I mean, the gums were not designed to hold the denture. Um, so that we are already on the back foot because of that. So we need to have a stable dentition. And the most important thing to look for, especially, is to look for an edentulous edential posterior dentition. So if the posterior teeth from five posterior is not there, more often than not, you'll find that the TMJ with the issue is on that side. So yes, if you if you if you're gonna if you're gonna do anything, you must rehabilitate the dentition before you treat anything. Thank you. Um, I'm going to again uh, sort of add two questions together again on on uh, bite plates. Will a dual laminate bite plate be effective for a Bruxa as well? And please explain your bite splint fabrication and what instructions do you give your lab technician? Okay, so dual laminates it depends on the on the technician. If it's, um, I try not to go thicker than two millimeters. So you 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 have to. You have to be, you know, accurate with your, with your. So normally, what I do is when I do a Mayo half, um, it's just an impression, top and bottom. When I do a um, a full coverage Michigan, always, I very rarely do dual laminates. Um, I always take a bite with it, and often what I do is I'll take the bite and I would sort of ask them to duplicate my bite into the bite. Plate. So you, you, you know what I'm saying? So the, the bite that I take, we, we bite up till it's about two millimeters thick or three millimeters thick. And then we, we have them, I ask the lab to articulate it and then we, we fit it that way. Um, another way of doing it is um, sending it to the dentist and have them make it. So um, I try not to take, you know, if I can, I send it back to the, to the dentist who referred the patient and they, and they make the bite bit for me. But the ones that I sort out myself, Usually that's how I do it. There are occasions when uh, I had one particular case not too long ago with idiopathic condylar resorption. So the, the left condyle was shook. The, the left uh, um, TMJ was affected. So the, the facial height on that side was lessened. And she only made contact on the 37, 3727 area. You've got to balance that bite yourself using articulating paper. It takes a long time, um, but it has to be perfect. Thank you. Um, do you treat patients with sleep apnea regularly? You know, the ones that I do treat um, are usually the ones that come from the physicians. So that particular patient had sleep apnea that I showed you earlier. Um, the ones that I do treat are, it's, it's, it's not um, out of, because I want to treat them because they are difficult patients to treat. They come with a whole lot of different comorbidities um, so I don't treat them often, but I, I do treat them when they come to me. Thank you. Um, this, I think, refers to the first case that you uh, presented. Was the occlusal uh, can corrected on the first case you presented? Her facial asymmetry was to the left, and the cant was clearly visible on the follow-up image. Yes, look, that's somebody with an uh, in internal derangement on the left side. When we, um, when we treated her with an arthroscopy, you found that the, the occlusion was a lot better the next, immediately post -op. So if you, if these are the types of patients that you would suggest, one, to see an orthodontist, um, because you want to get a better occlusion, and you work from, because TMJ can be multidisciplinary. That particular patient would need orthodontics, which I, I sent her for, um, and she's done really well. 
Yeah. That que- that question incidentally was asked by an orthodontist as well. I think that's why he asked it as well. <laughs> um, do you recommend hot or cold compress to assist with pain management? So you know, um, you can. It depends on the season, to be honest. Uh, I find that in, in in winter, you know, the TMJ symptoms seem to become aggravated because of the cold weather. Um, heat. Therapy works very well. Um, I, you know, just getting a normal bean bag and, and, and using that. Um, so I'm not a big fan of it, to be honest. So there are there are some a group of you know of, of, of individuals that prefer cold. My personal preference doesn't make me. I'm not I'm not perfect. But that's my personal preference. I prefer heat. Um, I, I I'm a big fan of acupuncture and dry needling and physiotherapy. In fact, what I do is I take a marker and I find the knots on the patient and I mark it for the family. And I tell the mother, listen, this is where the knots are. And at night, these, these are the areas that you will massage for. And I always ask, do you have sensitive skin? Is your skin sensitive? Can you use Onica? Can you use this? Can you use that? Can I put a trans at patch on for you? Um, and the, those are the different things that you can make use of. So I often write on people's faces and uh, Tell the parents because now with the with COVID, you can they're wearing a mask, so they don't mind. Um, so I mark it on their faces, and uh, it works. It works really well. If you just like any other knot, if you just lean into it, it does get better. Thank you. Um, you've mentioned, I think, your maximum thickness on a bite plate. What do you suggest the minimum thickness of a bite plate to be in order to be effective? Ah, uh, I'd say two length. Okay. Um, so. I'm injecting Botox for kids. Do you do this and at what amount? Not really. Um, you know, in kids, you, you always, you're always more careful. It's like giving a child a flu medicine who's under two. You know, if it's, uh, it's because there's no scientific evidence to say that it's safe. So Botox is a great thing. You know, uh, it, it, you can possibly do it, but I can't say that you can because it's, it's not something that's that's proven to be safe. Okay, then just a, a, co- a comment. Very interesting lecture. Thank you um, from Prof. Prof. Lurie. Following a motor vehicle accident, we have been programmed to prioritize symptoms. Delayed management down the line can cause degenerative arthritis. Make the TMJ an important aspect of management. Basically, just a statement there. Um, from Prof. Fleury, you mentioned using the bite plate for six months from K9 to K9. I think that's a Maya Health you were talking about. What about OV eruption of the posteriors? So that, that's why I'm going to it. In my health, a lot of people don't like it because of um, because of the risk of OV eruption. It does happen, um, and that's why short term usage is short term nocturnal usage. Um, so only sleep with it. And the ones where I've had OV eruption. Uh, were not very compliant, they would sit with it at the computer. So, you know, things like that. So the Maya health short term and then move on to a move on to a full coverage. Thank you. Then just um, some more uh, thanks for the great lecture. There's a question here, not saying to which case they're specifically talking. I think it was the last case you presented with a very underdeveloped mandible. Um, why was it chosen to retain his third molus? So this guy had obstructive sleep apnea and he also had a club foot. So the history goes where when he went for the surgery with a club foot, I don't think the anesthetist respected the retrognathic mandible as much as he should have or she should have. And they couldn't intubate it. So it was it was a bit of a, a bit of a nightmare to treat him. And eventually they gave him a spinal block to treat his foot. So when I saw him, you know, ideally I would have wanted to remove the wisdoms before I did any of it. Um, but because we we did the team joints, um, we were not going to keep him intubated overnight. We chose to do the the TMJ uh, and to prevent further swelling to the to the pharynx. We were not sure how he was going to behave, but although we, we I found that you know if we advance the mandle, we're going to open the airway complicating, you know, the, the TM joint prosthesis with removing the wisdoms at the same time, uh, you know, it was, it was just not a risk that we wanted to take. 
So uh, we decided to do the joints, secure his airway, you know, improve his airway, get rid of the apnea, and at the second stage, remove his wisdoms. That was the reason. Um, we just didn't know how he would behave, and we didn't want to take a chance. Thank you very much. I'm just trying to see this. Um, do you agree with Dr. Elizabeth Menzel, who says that children that grind are healthy? It is only the parents that are irritated. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So, but my wife grants, so maybe that's me. <laughs> right, let's just have a look if we've got any other questions here. Um, are you happy with laser usage? Each to its own. You know, ultrasound works, you know, it, it does work. So, it just depends on what you have available to you. I always say, you know, Treating these types of conditions, it's never a one-man show. If it's a one-man show, you're in trouble, you know? I've learned this from everybody who taught me. Um, and there's a multitude of them. And we sort of extract from all of them what works for you. And uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, you can use whatever you can. Um, I mean, you know, TMJs can be treated by orthodontists, by prosthodontists, by dentists, by ourselves, by physiotherapists. And uh, so why not use everybody? You know, the more the medium, cross pollinate, better. Right, and then just more uh, gratitude from Fricky Redinger, it's a nice presentation, EB. Um, I can't see any more other questions coming through. Just check on the, there were some questions coming through from YouTube as well. I'm just gonna see if we've got all of those. Um, just some comments here. Um, I happened to study under the late Henry Gramellian from the University of Florida, and his methodology was for the purposes of this review for the treatment of TMJ disorders. We divided it into six general treatment types physical medicine treatment, intraoral orthopedic appliances, pharma pharmacological therapy, behavioral and physiological therapy, temperament diligence, joint, joint surgery, and um, then six was occlusal treatments. So, just a statement there. Children grinding in the mixed dentition is normal. Once they're in full permanent dentition, treat the same as an adult. I think they are. That's basically agreeing with what you said there as well. Thank you for the comments coming through. I think that's about all the questions that we've received so far. Um, so if this, well, hold on, hold on. There's another one. Yeah, just this was really nice presentation. Really looking forward to more of this. Um, students at UWC, very Fascinating. Thank you for that comment as well. If there's no more questions, I'm going to hand over back to Dr. Harriet Janssen von Rensburg, um, just to thank the speaker first, please. Just want to thank Dr. Abram for his time and a very informative lecture. I hope you all have a very good evening. Thank you, uh, thank you Dr. von Rensburg. I think uh, Dr. Faker from Sada side, I think you've tried to simplify a really, really complex um, area of the of, of the um, of the face face um, very few dentists i think know how to treat it properly and thank you for giving us some guidance um, in the, in that regard um, just remind again of the webinars taking place tomorrow night and thursday night hosted by border k branch and um, northwest again thank you all for joining us this evening and uh, enjoy the rest of your day thank you so much bye-bye thank you bye-bye